Thank you. And um, it's kind of exciting to be in a crowd where I only know one person. I tend to speak in spaces where it's very much the work that I'm doing day to day. So I, I love this opportunity. So um, I'm Heidi Tate, the CEO of uh, Tangaroa Blue Foundation. And uh, we'd love to share a little bit of a story with you today. If I can change the slide. Oh, there we go. Okay, I wanted to give you some scenarios to start off with. So the first one is this one. A border force vessel navigates its way out to the middle of the Coral Sea and intercepts a fleet of illegal fishing vessels from Vietnam. The second one is the EPA in Victoria knocks on the door of a plastics manufacturer uh, who has a one-ton bulk of bag which equates to about 40 million plastic resin pellets, so small microplastics, leaching into a stormwater drain that goes into Port Phillip Bay in Melbourne. Uh, an international GPS uh, satellite commercial fishing buoy is recovered during a beach cleanup event uh, up in remote Cape York, and that's repurposed to track ghost nets drifting around the Great Barrier Reef. The ACCC investigates an Australian company claiming to make their products 100% out of ocean plastic um, recovered from the ocean and misleading consumers and um, investors. And the last one is the Ditch the Flick program, which has been installed in a stadium. Um, and during the NRL games of a season, they reduce cigarette butt litter by 71%. So what do all of these interventions have in common? Well, they all originated from a framework called the Australian Marine Debris Initiative, known as the AMD for short. So in 2004, I was diving um, in Western Australia as a diving instructor and spent most of my hours either in, on or under the water um, and created a, a massive connection with our oceans. But it was here that I also started to really examine the marine debris that I was finding on the beaches when I was down there. And one of the things that really struck me was the diverse point of origin of the things that I was finding. So here you can see beer bottles and cigarette butts from people sitting there watching the iconic sunsets over the Indian Ocean. But there's also debris from the ro local rock lobster industry and a lot of stuff with international sources on it or writing on it from all over the world. And this really highlighted to me the extent of the marine debris issue and how not just one solution was going to actually fix this issue. The question was why is it here and what needs to change to stop it from appearing in the first place. So I was a pretty logical person and invited the community to go and do a clean up but also to collect data on everything that we were finding. And a couple of weeks later we analysed the data to try and find out one item that we thought that we could make a shift in a change in. And uh, out of that, we actually got legislative change. And we were able to get the WA fisheries legislation changed to ban plastic packing tape that they were using in the rock lobster industry from ever being on commercial or recreational fishing vessels in Western Australia. And therefore, it couldn't get lost into the environment. So for us, that was proof of concept. You could take citizen science data, collect it in a really good way, engage the right stakeholders, and you could actually get change. And that's actually what happens now with the Australian Marine Debris Initiative. It's now a process of removing, recording, analysing, tracking, engaging, implementing and monitoring. All the steps that we actually need to do if we're going to reduce the amount of plastics that are in our oceans. And it's built on a philosophy. If all we do is clean up, that's all we're ever going to do. So that brings me back to the scenarios that I talked about right at the beginning. Now all of those are real scenarios and they all resulted from citizen science data that was collected and inputted into the AMD database and then it was used with the right stakeholder groups to find solutions to litter and marine debris we were finding washing up on our coastline. So to date, this is the impact of the AMD network. And this is not just the Tangaroa Blue team, but this is over 3,500 partner organisations that contribute their data to a central database for maximum um, impact. We've just ticked over actually 24 million data points. There's more than 35,000 cleanup events. And more importantly, we have more than 726,000 volunteer hours. So people are committed to this issue if they're not just rubbish collectors, but part of a solution.
That equates to about $25 million of in-kind um, in kind support and volunteer hours. And it means now that the AMD database is actually the biggest one in the Southern Hemisphere and one of the biggest ones in the world. Now, Tangaroa Blue's clean-up activities are mostly public-facing. That's what people see or hear about us. But most of the work that we do is actually behind the scenes after the clean-up when we get the data. And that data tells us lots of things. The first one is, everywhere we go around Australia, there is real different regional marine debris signatures. What we find on a beach in remote Cape York is completely different to what we find in Port Phillip Bay on St Kilda Beach. So there's not just one solution. And although the data collection can take us at least twice as long as the cleanup actually did, it's this data that actually has the longest benefit for our environment because it can be used time and time again. Um, it helps us to guide strategies, identify issues and hotspots, and more importantly, it helps us to monitor the impact of strategies, things like federal government and state government plans and policies, community um, litter projects, and even best practice from industry programs. If you can't measure your impact, there's no way to know if you're actually making a difference or not, so the data is critical. Now, tech is becoming more and more important for the AMT framework. Um, we need accurate, detailed, integrated and efficiently collected data. Our old paper data sheets now have been <laughs> way long gone and we have a data collection app and a database portal, management portal online. We now have a handheld spectrometer from Chinamex that helps us to identify polymer types out in the field. And that helps us to recycle as much of the plastics as we possibly can. But there's still many um, situations when tech and I AI still won't collect the data that we actually need. And this manual handling takes a lot of time and resources. So how big is the marine debris um, issue? So global plastic production has ridden, uh, risen exponentially over the last decades. It now amounts to some 400 million tonnes per year. Now an estimated 12% of that gets incinerated and only 9% is actually getting recycled. So the rest of it ends up in landfill and some of it escapes into the environment and into our oceans. And without meaningful action, the annual flow rates of plastic waste into the aquatic ecosystems is expected to nearly triple, from about 11 million tonnes in 2016 to an estimated 29 million tonnes in 2040. Now, more than 800 marine and coastal species are affected by marine debris through ingestion or entanglement or degradation of their critical habitat. But if you're not interested in saving turtles, let's look a little closer to home. We're finding plastics in our blood, the air we breathe, the food we eat, and the water that we drink. Plastics are being found in the Mariana Trench and on Mount Everest. They're everywhere. And science hasn't really still figured out what that actually means for humans. But with at least 10,000 unique chemicals used in different combinations for different products, and the burden to prove harm on the consumer instead of the burden of safety on the producer, I think it's pretty clear that there is actually no um, other outcome than human health to be negatively impacted. And that can be through fertility, hormonal, metabolic and neurological activity. The United Nations Environment Program have said that the impacts of plastic production and pollution on the triple planetary crisis of climate change, nature loss and pollution are a catastrophe in the making. So here's the challenges if you choose to accept. Removing what's out there. Last month our team worked with the Woodity traditional custodians to clean up one of the most remote sections of Cape York. No road, no boat access, so a helicopter was the only way in and out for the people and the rubbish. The team removed 10.8 tonnes from 2.8 kilometres of beach. That's around three tonnes per kilometre. Could you imagine that much rubbish sitting on Bondi Beach? And the debris actually doesn't stop flowing onto the beach, so we know that the beach cleanup itself is only a very short um, outcome. Here's our helicopter. 
Now, when Plastics Now Oceans first hit the news over a decade ago, the media had this idea that there was this island of plastics floating around there, and everybody asked, so hey, why can't we go and, boat, go and get a boat and just go and pick it up and collect it? Unfortunately, it's not an island, it's plastic soup, so much more difficult to actually remove. So currently, the most cost-effective way to deal with this is to actually collect it when it's on a beach. Although, like in Cape York, it's actually very massively logistically expensive and uh, quite an exercise. So collecting by hand is extremely time consuming and labour intensive, especially when you want to remove the degraded bits of microplastics and nanoplastics as well. So there we have challenge number one. I think I need a plastic magnet. Data collection also takes a massive amount of time, so we actually need to have AI that helps us accurately identify items and also the source. So that's challenge number two. And then what do we do with it after we've collected it? We can't recycle our way out of this. Now, unfortunately, consumers and investors have been led to believe there's currently a solution to ocean plastic to make products, and I'm sure you've seen some of these online or in the supermarket. So when most people hear that a product is made out of ocean plastic or ocean-bound plastic, they think it's been collected from the ocean and made into a product. But when you follow the asterisks that are on all of these products and the advertising, you actually realise that only a very small amount of it came from the ocean, and in fact, the ocean is defined anywhere up to 50 kilometres from the ocean, so somewhere near Penrith. <laughs> Now, the ACCC has put a focus on greenwashing, or in this case, blue washing. and after a joint complaint we made with the Environmental Defender's Office last year, um, we've got brands that are starting to really rethink their, uh, their messaging. So, ocean-bound plastic crates were removed from the shelves of Bunnings after Bunnings couldn't actually confirm their supply chain, and they couldn't prove that there was actually any pla ocean plastic in their products, and this was uh, confusing consumers. Zero Co here loves to use happy leaping purple dolphins to get you to buy their plastic products. Somehow buying more plastic products will have less plastic in the oceans. And Moo Yogurt claims to have 100% ocean plastic in their yogurt containers, although chemists will tell you that you can't use 100% ocean plastic to make anything, especially not food grade plastic because of the contamination. So challenge number three is to find solutions about what's being removed from our environment, but do it in a fit for purpose, credible and transparent way that doesn't mislead consumers or investment. So at Blues Fest in 2019, we were able to actually reduce 48,000 single-use water bottles from being prevented from being used um, by using uh, a wee refill machine. So this provided the three C's of water, clean, cold, and convenient, and it was done um, by putting these uh, machines around the sites. Now, this is what we call shifting the single-use plastic economy. You can remove plastic or single-use plastic water bottles, but you can't not provide what a single-use plastic water bottle gives, and that's clean, cold, and convenient water. The other thing is you can't take away the revenue from selling the single-use plastic water bottles. So these machines actually shifted the economy by allowing marketing to provide an economic benefit, by providing a refill option, and by also enabling the um, community to get involved with this program. So to wrap up, I just want to leave you with three key messages. Pollution is a result of design failure. From the concept phase to the end of life of a product, whether it's a product itself or the packaging, should be included in the design. Let's stop making cheap crap that has no value, a short lifespan of use, and a long lifespan as waste. Procurement, investment, and grant funding needs to be incentivizing best practice. Operation Clean Sweep is a plastics industry best practice program included in the National Plastics Plan. And um, you can actually get your procurement and your funding to make that a requirement before you give anybody money. We should be rewarding best practice. And to be credible. A recent report published by the ACCC showed that 57% of websites and businesses that were reviewed in internet sweeps made concerning claims about their environmental credentials. If we use ocean-bound plastic as an example, let's call it what it is, post-consumer waste. Greenwashing not only rips off the consumer, it disadvantages those companies using credible and accurate marketing campaigns.
So we're proud of what we've been able to achieve over the last 20 years with our collaboration of partners from industry, government and community. And we're excited about what is possible as technology evolves. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to a new group that I would normally never reach. And I hope that if any of this resonates with you, that you come and have a talk to me and see how we can work together within the AMD network. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Heidi.